Hey guys, happy Monday. I know it's a different day of the week than usual, so that's exciting. Sorry, getting my computer all set up for this. So I know that we usually meet on Wednesday, but the university is closed on Wednesday. So we're going to meet today. I have five problems to solve. Most of them will take a while, but we'll give you guys a little bit just in case you're getting the alerts and you're saying like, what? I didn't know we were meeting today. We totally are. We are gonna look at chapter nine. I posted the questions just a little bit ago. Um, I can see that you guys are still working through the videos. Um, I know they're kind of a lot this week, but today we are going to work on drawing structures. So we're going to draw different things. Mostly we will draw today. I think this will help as we can kind of see I draw on the videos, but now we can draw in this space to where there's a little bit more three dimensions because it's kind of hard to get that in a static picture. So how are you guys doing today? Um, let's see. I'm trying, I feel like there should be something more exciting. <gasps> I put up my Christmas wreath this week, weekend. Um, yeah, I just felt like I needed a little festivity in my life. 2020, you know, why not? So it will give you guys another couple of minutes or so to kind of show up. Feel free to pop into the comment box and say howdy. Um, it's November. I realized when I looked at the calendar, we only have two more live sessions after this. That's right. I will admit that I was shook myself. So today we're gonna start with the base geometries and we will work our way forward. Hopefully, if you guys have questions, I'll be able to answer them. If you don't, that's okay too. Um, I probably should have sent out an announcement that reminded people we were doing this today. But I kind of forgot because it was Monday. So let's see. Let me grab all my things while you guys are getting your papers and pencils together. Chapter nine, there we go. So the first question today is in huge font, but that's all right. So today we're gonna talk about drawing in electron geometry. So if you've watched the video chapter nine, part one, it it's I think titled molecular shapes. So in molecular shapes, there are basically five base geometries. And then depending on how many either atoms or electrons, lone pairs, are on these compounds, that tells you which category it turns into. So we have a base geometry followed by the molecular geometry. So we're gonna draw the five base geometries. So I'm going to start with the bigger compounds. So we have steric numbers at two through six, SN two, SN three, whoops, SN four, my goodness, SN five. I'm gonna go a little bit more space, and SN six, where SN is the steric number. So SN two means that there are two things connected to our central atom. So in the video, I talked about it being AX2, where we have A in the center and X on either side. And so in this case, we have a 180 degree bond angle. So if you were to name this electron geometry, it would be named linear. So some of these structures, I don't wanna say make a lot of sense, but their names are not that far from what we think about. So if we have AX3, where A is our central atom, X is our exterior atoms, we're going to put our A in the center, connecting our three X's. These here are 120 degrees, and this is trigonal planar. So in this case, this molecule, if you were to, I should have brought my model kit, but I forgot. 
into my office. Uh, this is gonna, this is gonna be awesome. Oh wait. That's not really gonna work. We can do trigonal planner by hand. Trigonal planner basically means we have three items. They are 120 degrees apart or approximately that. You do not need to use a compass or anything else. So we have these three <laughs> markers. They look like this. So one of the things you'll notice is if I turn it this way, it's a flat molecule. Planar means flat. It's just a fancy word for flat. You know, scientists are crazy. So in this case, we are going to have a trigonal planar where these are all 120 degrees apart. So now let's look at serif number four with AX4. We're going to put our A in the center. And now we're going to start to see compounds that are above and below the plane of the board. Luckily, we have a model. So, someone left this in here. What I have drawn for you, so if you were to, like, I know that I'm still in two dimensions because you're watching me on YouTube, but what we can see is that we have a central atom. This is our A. The red ball in the blue are behind one another in this structure. So we, what we're thinking about is that this bond angle here is 109.5. So it's 109, as is this angle, this angle, or this. Now, you'll notice that while these atoms are color-coded, regardless of how I spin this in any direction, the orientation between these is pretty consistent. That is what this steric number means. So. If these two, okay, let me do this a different way. If the yellow and the white are in a plane, we had a piece of paper right here, this is the wedge atom, it is in front of that. As you can see, because I've put my hand along the bottom, it is in front of that. Now, where did the one in the back go? It is back here. So the wedges and the dash tell us that they're in three dimensions. On exam three and the final, you will be expected to be able to draw those in this type of orientation. Now, the wedge always means in the front, the dash always means on the back. That is what this structure is. So this steric number of four is considered tetrahedral. So if we think about, also if at any point you have a question, feel free to drop it in this chat box right here. I am happy to answer that today. And hopefully, it's kind of, you're like, oh yeah, she talked about that in the video. So for a steric number of five, we have AX5, where we have a central atom. With five components connected to it where the top, the axial to the equatorial are 90 degrees, and the bond angle between on the equatorial plane is 120 degrees. So these are 109. So in this case, for the trigonal bipyramidal, This means that there are five components connected to that central atom. Now, when we think about trigonal planar and to some extent tetrahedral, we don't see large differences whether you have one electron pair or two. Once we get to the steric number of five and six, as we swap out the X's or the atoms for lone pairs, it doesn't matter where those go. Electrons wanna be as far apart as humanly possible from another pair of electrons. They are repelled by each other. So that's an important distinction between those. So for the steric number of six, we have AX6 with our A in the center. And our X's all spread out and all of our bond angles are 90 degrees. And this is octahedral. 
So those are the five base geometries. So as we move forward on, I think questions two, really on most of the questions, if it asks you for the electron geometry and the molecular geometry, these five base geometries are the five electron geometries. The molecular geometry is what it's called when one of these X's has turned into a lone pair. And so once that happens, we have to be able to name the shape based on what we can see. Now, spectroscopically, we are starting to be able to detect electrons. Most of the time, we cannot detect electrons. We can only detect atoms. So that's what we need to think about. What questions do we have about these structures? And as always, if you have none, you can drop none in the box. There aren't many of you guys here today because I know it's a different day of the week. Um, and so if you don't have any questions, you can just say none. I'll give you about 30 seconds. If you are watching this at a later date or time, you can drop it in the comment box below and I will try to respond to that in the comments as well. Thanks, Catherine. I'm glad you're here today. Nice. Hi, Jeremy. Good to see you, too. Oh, that's real small. Let me make that a bigger font. So, So our next question is about sigma and pi bonds. So it asks, what is the major difference between a sigma and a pi bond, and how many electrons are in each bond? So each bond contains two electrons. So if you have a sigma bond, it contains two electrons. equals two electrons, a pi bond also equals two electrons. Now, the trick is, if we were to have this structure, we have a single bond and a double bond. Each of those contain two electrons. Between the carbons, there are four electrons. The main difference between a sigma bond and a pi bond is that the sigma bond, so sigma bonds are along the internuclear axis, and pi bonds are perpendicular. Otherwise known as above or below. So a sigma bond and a pi bond, most of the time, so if you've watched that video, now that's 9.4, you will have to either click the link in the announcement or go on to the chapter nine playlist to find it, because it's a little bit older, so it's in the old style. Um, but what we'll see is that a sigma-sigma bond is between the two nuclei, so they point at each other for that orbital overlap. A pi bond, if this is our internuclear axis, all right, I really should have brought my model kit today, but the pi bonds are above and below, so we have a sigma bond between the axis and a pi bond above that axis. So it could be above and below or in front and behind but it is not between the two nuclei. So that's the main difference between a sigma bond and a pi bond. 
They both arise from orbital overlap in this case. What questions do you have about sigma and pi bonds? Because after this, we're going to draw structures for a while. Questions, thoughts? Oh, hi, Camillo. I didn't see your comment. I'm glad you're here, too. So next, Oops. so our next question is which of these molecules is polar? So this question requires that you draw the structures for each of these four compounds. So we're going to draw four compounds and then we're going to ask which one is. Ooh, Jordan has a question. Hi, Jordan. Um, are sigma bonds only with an orbital overlap. Oh, an S orbital overlap. No. So a sigma bond can be any orbital overlap in any compound. So it could either be an S or any of the hybridized orbitals will create a sigma bond. A pi bond only arises from a pure P overlap. Is that kind of where the, I don't want to call it confusion, but is that where your question arises from, Jordan? We'll give the delay a second so we can answer that question before we start drawing. The next, but while we're waiting, I will erase the board. Ooh, and Jordan says that hybrid orbitals are a little confusing. So after this. We will, after this question, we will talk about hybrid orbitals so that we can all think about that together. Good statement of question, I guess we'll call it. So which of these molecules is polar? So we have four compounds. It is four different central atoms, all of which have fluorine as the atoms. So in this case, we need to follow the guidelines. Draw a Lewis dot structure. Check for formal charges. Then we can draw a vesper structure based on the Lewis dot structure. So it is impossible for us to answer this question without drawing a structure. Polarity of a molecule cannot be determined just based on whether or not the bond is polar. Because if that was true, we pretty easily know that it's BF3. But, not to give it away, but BF3 is not polar. So let's look at drawing all the Vesper structures so that we can determine whether or not they are polar or not. So BF3. Our valence electrons are 3 plus 7 times 3, which is 24. So our Lewis dot structure will look like this. So we know that this structure has a steric number of three because there are three things connected to the central atom. One, two, three. A steric number of three has a base geometry of a trigonal planar. So that looks like this. So from here, we could ask ourselves, is this 
molecule polar. So if we want to ask ourselves that question, we can look at all of the different dipole moments. All of these bonds pull at the exact same strength from the central atom. So one pulls up, two of them pull out. It turns out because they all pull at the exact same component, there is no polarity in this molecule. So this molecule is nonpolar. But it is composed of three significantly polar bonds. So the arrangement of the bond is going to be important for determining polarity. So for our next one, it is CF3. No, CF4, sorry about that. The valence electrons are 4 plus 7 times 4, which is 32. Our Lewis dot structure, we connect carbon in the center, put all of our fluorine atoms around. I heard a comment. Ooh, Jordan asks, how do you determine if a molecule is symmetrical? So in this case, all of these are compounds. So the symmetry here is based on the fact that these are all 120 degrees. So that symmetry of the 120 degrees apart makes it look kind of like a peace sign or a triangle. So in that case, symmetry could be determined if you could spin that molecule, if you could basically, it's gonna make me like feel real old, but if you were to treat BF3 like a fidget spinner and spin one of those components, it would look the same as it spun around. That would be the symmetry of this molecule. So for CF4, in this structure, you could rotate this any number of degrees and it will always look the same. Hypothetically, if one of these were to be a hydrogen, that molecule would no longer have symmetry to the same degree because it would be three fluorines and one hydrogen. So from here we can tell or we can count that our steric number is one, two, three, four. So we're going to have a tetrahedral molecule. We're gonna put all of our fluorines around and spend three days adding lone pairs. So now in this case, we have this orientation for our molecule. And no matter how we look at this, all of these bonds, while none of them appear to be equivalent, because that, it's hard to think about this in three-dimensional space, when we do think about this in three-dimensional space, the reality is that all of these components pull equivalently on the central atom. So therefore, our molecule is nonpolar. So let's look at PF3, which I think is the next one. Our valence electrons our 5 plus 3 times 7 is 26. We're going to put our three fluorines around the phosphorus. We're going to go ahead and add lone pairs. At this point, you have likely, well, you haven't likely, you have used 24 of the electrons. So we've used 24. No. Yes, 24. We have 26. So I'm going to add these two here. So now when we look at the phosphorus, it still has a steric number of four, right? Because the electron lone pairs on the phosphorus count. So when we draw this, we're going to have our phosphorus in the center, three fluorines and a lone pair. I'm going to put my lone pair at the top. You could have put it on any of these sides. They're all equivalent. When we do this, whoops, that's not what this right there. 
we end up with this molecule. Now, In this structure, we have the red, blue, and yellow ball uh, atoms, as well as this single white element. When this becomes a lone pair, it's going to, comp to compress this bond angle just a little. So it's going to be less than 109, roughly 107. So it's going to be a little bit less. When that happens, this lone pair is going to change the orientation of this molecule. Now, all three of these are quite polar bonds. They're all drawing the electron density. They're changing the electron density. Therefore, this is going to be a polar molecule with an overall molecular dipole. So each of these bonds has a dipole moment. And because there are four pieces, and these three are all pointing this way, basically I have this structure going on, it is going to give you a polarity. So this is one polar molecule. So this is polar. And I think I have space over here. Yes. Well, we're going to make it work. So if we have X, E, F, 2, We're going to make this go away, too. Please excuse the fact that I'm making faces, but it's good enough. So we have X, E, F, 2. So our valence electrons are 8 plus 2 times 7, which is 22. Yes. So we're going to put our xenon in the middle. We're going to connect our two fluorines. Now, a Lewis dot structure is at 90 degrees, regardless. So from here, we're going to use up our electrons. So now we've used 16 of our 22, which means that we have three lone pairs left. We're going to put them here. And we're going to put our third pair here. So we have a steric number of 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. So we know that that is a base octahedral. No, base trigonal planar. Sorry about that. So the question becomes, where do we put the lone pairs versus the atoms? The lone pairs want as much space as possible. They want to be able to spread out. If you only had two lone pairs, they would go on the top and the bottom. However, we have three. So if you put one at the top, one at the bottom, and one at the side, these would be at 90 degrees. The maximum separation would be 120 if you put them all along the plane. So they can spread out as much as they want in this plane. So the structure you would get looks like this. And this would be a nonpolar. So the reason it is nonpolar is because the three atoms are in a line, and so we know it based on the geometry of that bond. A, it's not superpolar based on the electronegativities, but the other issue is that it does not pull. If everyone's pulling in the same direction, it's like tug of war. In this tug of war, they cannot overcome one another because they're in this arrangement. So as we think about polarity, what questions do we have about this type of a question, where we take the bonds that we know are polar, really anything with a fluorine, and now put them into a three-dimensional structure and ask ourselves, what does this look like? So what questions do you have? How are we feeling about this topic? Let me know.
will you be asked to draw partial charges? Jordan, are you asking? So in the videos, I think I drew, if there were a BF bond, it would look kind of like this, where the electron density is disturbed. Are you asking about that? Or are you asking, would you have to calculate that and tell me what the partial charge is on any of these structures? If you're asking about calculating it and saying, these are going to be delta minus and this will be delta plus, no. You're only asked to include a formal charge on any structure in my class. If you're asking about this, the answer is also no. I will not be asking you to do that. Camillo asks, what would be an example of a polar molecule with more than one lone pair? One second. Catherine says, I'm kind of lost, but you haven't gotten to the video. That makes sense. So, I'm sorry, you haven't gotten to the video. I'm sorry about the confusion. Uh, not the confusion. I'm sorry we have a holiday and it's destroying our, like, regularly scheduled routine. But, that's okay. So, polarity is an answer or it's a question about who hogs the electrons more. So the reason the structure matters when we think about the question of where are the electrons in three-dimensional space. So when we have a trigonal planar molecule, it's in the plane of this, it's in the plane of my hand, we have one up and two out on the sides like this. Because each of those pull at the same rate, no one can win. The way I like to picture polarity is tug of war. A polar bond, this bond pulls the tug of war away from the center. So when we think about polarity in terms of yanking the electron density from the central atoms or shoving it back on it, either way, you can think about it where different components are connected to a ring. And these different bonds are basically different people trying to pull the central dynamic ring. In the case of BF3, in this superpolar bond, because they're all oriented in this way, all of them cancel each other out. Now, if you are taking physics or I'm sure some like advanced math class where you can add and subtract vectors, which I'm not going to ask you to do at all. So please don't, don't panic at home, don't panic here. We're just going to think about vectors. Overall, when we think about polarity, it's going to ask about the molecular arrangement around the central atom. If they're in a line, not polar, because they can't pull more or less than someone else. It gets a little murky when we start to move into tetrahedral structures, but one good question, which is kind of what Camilla thought about, is the lone pair often induces polarity. It just does. More often than not, if there are polar bonds and a lone pair, that molecule will be polar. Unless it looks like this, and it's nonpolar due to the arrangement. So, sorry, I'm looking for a blank space on the board. This. I'm sorry if the like rolling makes it a little nauseating. I'm a little concerned about it. So Camilla asks, what is a, what would be an example of a polar molecule with more than one lone pair? So one good example for that is water. So H2O, our valence electrons are two times one plus six, which equals eight. We know oxygen is our central atom. We end up with this structure to where we have oxygen with two lone pairs and two hydrogen atoms. When we draw this structure, because it has a steric number of four, we're going to put our oxygen here. And 
And now we're going to have our two lone pairs sticking up at the top. So, if this is our structure, these are our atoms, these are our lone pairs up at the top. In this case, the hydrogen-oxygen bond is polar. It is polar towards oxygen. So oxygen is hoarding. Hoarding is probably a really strong word. It is slightly hoarding. If they were sharing a blanket, hydrogen and oxygen, hydrogen would be a little cold sometimes, but not like all the time. So oxygen is drawing the electron density towards itself. So in this case, our two polar bonds give rise to a polar molecule in this direction. So that would be an example of a compound with two lone pairs and two bonds. But you can see how we would be unable to determine that from our Lewis dot structure. So a Vesper structure, the fancy 3D structures, come from the ability to distinguish what this looks like in three-dimensional space. So, how, what are our, so let's see. How do we feel about that example, Camilla? And Catherine, when we think about polarity with only the information presented here, so it's okay, you can ask questions that might be covered in the videos. So what other questions do you have about polarity before we, and I'm gonna be honest, if all we talk about is polarity, that's okay. We will draw more structures because I don't think we'll talk about polarity for the rest of time. Whatever we don't get to, there's only five today, so we have two left. Whatever we don't get to, I will just add to the exam three review, which is next Monday. Uh, oh, I'm glad that helped. So I know that polarity can feel very like, I'm not really sure what to do with it. Follow the guidelines, draw loose dot structure, draw a Vesper structure. From the Vesper structure, look at the orientation. And since there's not that many of you, there are not that many ways that we can ask polarity questions, to be quite honest. It's kind of a question of what do they look like in this case? Um, I also remembered that I told Jordan we would take a detour through a hybridization questions. Okay, so Catherine asks, what is a steric number? Good question. So in the textbook, they do not use that term. So I call it a steric number because it makes, in my mind, a lot of sense of how many things are stuck to things on the central atoms. And Camilla is exactly correct. It's the number of items stuck around the central atom. So it just is how many things there are. Um, I, it is how we break. So in the first question, we drew those five structures. That is the steric numbered structures. Good question. So I'm going to erase the board, and then we're going to think about, talk about some hybridization type questions. But I will go ahead. No, I will not show you number four yet. Hybridization. Let's think about, so um, we're going to take a brief sec, a brief aside on what is hybridization, what does that mean, and why do we care about it. So hybridization is the next step. So if you were to think about how a Lewis dot structure is what we teach you first, and that basically is an arrangement of how things are connected. But what we realized is that that two-dimensional structure does not tell us about what it looks like in 3D space. It really doesn't. It doesn't tell us about the orientation of this molecule in 3D space. And so that orientation is important. Here's why. When we think about drug molecules, so not illegal drugs, but more like if you were to take 
ibuprofen or any other compound. That compound is going to bind to a receptor in your body. It does that based on a fit, kind of like a hand fits inside a glove. If you've never seen a hand, well, I don't know how that would work in your life, but if you've never seen a hand, it would be really hard for you to draw, to make a glove based solely on this structure. Or the glove that you got would only fit sometimes. It wouldn't be a great fit. There's, not, there's more dynamics in those. So the reason 3D structure or VSEPR is important is it tells us how to take a flat 2D molecule and make it into a 3D shape. Hybridization is the next step in this like chain. Hybridization tells us electronically how we got these bonds. So the reason hybridization is important is because if we think about a structure, so let's look at CH4. So if we look at the valence electrons, we have four plus four times one, that gives us eight. Our Lewis dot structure is going to look like this. So we know that this Lewis dot structure is in two dimensions. Based on Vesper theory, because there are four things connected to it, we know that it's going to be a base tetrahedral. So now we have this base tetrahedral molecule. But let's think about how these two electrons, the 1s electron in the hydrogen, interacts with the carbon atom. So for hydrogen, we have the 1s. It has one electron. For carbon, we have the 1s, 2s, 2p, So if we go all the way back to chapter six, which wasn't that long ago, but what we have is our electron configuration. So in order to make a bond, two electrons, one from one atom and one from the other atom, have to come together to make a bond. It's basically this orbital overlap that I draw, which is basically two things kind of overlapping, makes sense. That's what we're looking for. When we have orbital overlap, one guy brings one electron, the other guy, gal, atom, call them atoms, each electron brings one electron. Each atom brings one electron. Together, they, for lack of a better term, kind of hold hands and make a bond. This bond comes from atom number one and atom number two, both coughing off an electron. I'm not totally th thrilled with that, but we're going to roll. So now that we have this, if we look at this electron configuration, we need to make four bonds, but we only have two really available places for where this could work. Based on the orientation of the p orbitals, which are on the x, y, and z axis, we would have a carbon atom connected at 90 degrees to two hydrogens, but only two. We know that we have four. So we need a way to create four equivalent orbitals. Now. What we're going to do is we're going to take these four electron orbitals, we're going to put them all into a bowl, we're going to mix it up. Now, mathematically, this is done through calculations, and there is a lot of evidence that tells us that this really happens, that they are mathematically averaged and combined. This is Gen Chem 1, so we're going to pretend it's kind of like baking a cake. You pour it in the cake mix, the eggs, the oil, maybe a little vanilla for some spice, you stir it up, and you got a cake. If the math interests you, stick around as a chemistry major. We will look at this math in physical chemistry, and it's super cool. But we're going to put these four orbitals together. We're going to shake them around. And what's going to come out are four equivalent orbitals. So this is going to transition into the 1s. And then we're going to have the, the S, P, three orbitals. Sometimes you can put the two in front. You don't have to. So now we're going to take our same six electrons. And when we do this, we can clearly see that there are four orbitals with only a single electron. Those four orbitals with only one electron 
will work, not work, create a bond with the 1s electron. When we average the 90 degree orbitals with the s orbital, it turns out that what we get out is 109.5 degrees. Now, this is a lot of like words. I'm not, I'm not going to deny that I gave you a lot of words. When we think about determining the orbital hybridization, like what is the hybridization of this element? It turns out that it's relatively simple. For any element or any compound where the steric number is three, it is an sp2 hybridized orbital. The way I like to think about it is how many equivalent orbitals are there? If it's sp, then there are just two equivalent orbitals. If it's sp2, there are three. So for a steric number of two, it is always going to be equal to an sp hybrid. For s, a steric number of three, it's always sp2 hybrid. A steric number of four is sp3 hybrids. For steric numbers of five and steric numbers of six, there is no hybrid. Now, in other chemistry courses, you may have heard about SPD hybridization. That is often taught. One of the issues with the SPD hybridization is that it collapses mathematically. What does that mean? That is fancy science speak for saying, when you average these numbers, the answer isn't what it looks like. Here's an appropriate example of when things don't work. If I make cupcakes, the back of the Betty Crocker box says I'm gonna get 24 cupcakes. I usually only get 20. Now, why is that? Uh, because I do not follow their advice. I would prefer to make bigger cupcakes than smaller cupcakes. That's just my life choice. You don't have to choose that. But in this case, that's why we don't have the hybridization. So in this class, we will only ask about these hybridizations. So when you can calculate this, you could basically look at any stereocenter, fancy word for the central atom, and say how many things are connected to it, and that's what the hybridization is. There aren't really any example questions. I think there might be part in the last one, which I don't think we'll get to today, but we might surprise ourselves. So what questions do we have about hybridization? Did this make it better? Did this make it worse? If you haven't watched the video and you're like, I don't know what just happened, that's okay too. You can watch this again after you watch the video. This what else? So what questions do we have about that? Before we go and draw some more structures. So Jordan asks, we'll talk about SPD hybrids in other classes, not in the chemistry department at UNF. Um, I have taught dehybridization in Gen Chem at other institutions where I've taught. Um, universally, we don't tend to talk about that hybridization. It turns out that those structures are a different type. The other thing is the mathematics are changing in that. So by and large, in Gen Chem 1 and 2, in Organic 1 and 2, we will not talk about SPD hybrids. We will only talk about these three hybridization classes. But Jordan, if you have other questions about that, feel free to pop in office hours or send me an email and we can chat about what those are and kind of why they don't really work if you're super curious about it. So our next question 
is to draw the Vesper structures. All right, that, that didn't work. It's on the line. Draw the Vesper and name the electron and molecular geometry for these five compounds. So, all of these, the idea of drawing any of these is somewhat overwhelming, right? You'll notice I just kind of like, I don't say throw it up on the board, but a little bit. So here's the thing with any of these structures. If you draw close to 100 structures before exam three, and you're like, 100? Hang tight. So the more of these you draw, the easier they are to draw. Because then you'll be like, there are five things. It's got to be either trigonal bipyramidal or octahedral. Can't be anything else. The more you draw, the faster it goes. So let's start with PCL5. Is that what's on there? Yes. So PCL5. So we have a phosphorus with a valence electron of 5 plus 7, that's 5 times 7, and that, which gives us 40. Phosphorus in the center, we're going to connect our five atoms. We're going to use, we're going to make, not use, we're going to put all of our electrons out here. It will be tempting to not draw your lone pairs. Don't fall for that trap, it's a terrible plan. So now we've used our valence electrons. When we can come back and look at this, we can say we've used eight times five electrons, which is 40, we've used all of our electrons. Let's double check our formal charge before we get moving. For phosphorus, it would be five minus half of 10 minus zero, zero. Chlorine would be seven minus half of two minus six, also zero. So that tells us that phosphorus can violate octet because there are 10 electrons around it. That's all right. So in this case, we can count one, two, three, four, five. There are five things connected to phosphorus. So we know that it's going to have a trigonal bipyramidal structure. We're going to draw our phosphorus. We're going to draw all of our chlorines. And we're going to add all of our lone pairs. Which again will take 300 days. but you will end up with this structure. Now the question asks you to identify the electron domain and the molecular geometry. So the electron and the molecular geometry are trigonal by pyramidal. So you, if it asks for both, have to identify that. If they're the same, you could have written E slash MG both trigonal bipyramidal. I, as long as you identify that you have both. You can't just write trigonal bipyramidal once and hope for the best. It will ask you for both on the exam. You do have to identify both. So what questions do we have about this structure? Well, you can drop those in the chat box over there, and I will start on uh, aluminum trichloride. Four valence electrons. When we draw this structure, we have 
we now have used 24 valence electrons. The formal charge here for aluminum would be 3 minus half of 6, which is 0. For chlorine, it is 7 minus half of 2 minus 6, which is also 0. I have had students in the past try to figure out if it's chlorine iodine. So, no, carbon iodine. That pretty much never, never exists. Isn't aluminum chloride an ionic compound? Uh, you can draw a Lewis dot structure and a compound. It also, because of aluminum's location being a P block element, it is also, aluminum chloride actually has some molecular compound character, even though it is a metal, non-metal compound. Because we will also be able to draw Lewis dot structures with like 10 and antimony, which are metal type compounds. So good question. Um, assume pretty much if I give you one of these, it will definitely be a valence. It will have the ability to draw this structure. Good question. So from here, there are three things connected to it. So we have a steric number of three which gives us this compound. Which the electron and molecular geometry are both trigonal planar. So other questions about this compound. Other thoughts about drawing these structures. How do we feel about this in general? Love it, hate it, easy. I'm gonna like it more when I practice more. What are our thoughts? Do we have thoughts? Have I overwhelmed you? Do we hate our lives? Nice, we got some easies, some simples. So for our next question, the valence electrons are seven plus two times six plus one, which gives us 20. charges of bromine, 7 minus half of 4 minus 6 gives us a plus 1 charge. So we are actually going to create this structure, which has, for the formal charge, bromine oops, will be 7 minus half of 6 minus 4, which is 0. This oxygen here will have a negative charge based on the formal charge. 6 minus half of 2 minus 6, negative 1. This doesn't have 1. For a Vesper structure, you do not need to draw the multiple resonance structures in this case. But there is a singular resonance structure for this compound. So when we look at this, we count there's 1, 2, 3, 4. So our steric number is 4. Double bond only count as one thing. 
So the reason I like steric numbers is because it's number of things connected, not bonds. Because in this case, the sigma and the pi bond makes it a little bit more complicated because it feels like it could be two. So there's the steric number of four, which gives us a base tetrahedral. So we're going to have two lone pairs, come out an oxygen, with a negative charge. So in this case, our electron, ge uh, electron geometry is tetrahedral, and our molecular geometry is bent. So now this molecule is a little bit more complicated. Some of the ones that we've started with are a little bit different. But what questions do we have about BrO2 minus as opposed to any of the other ones we've started with? So for our next compound, it's you may recognize these from last week's. They're the same Lewis dot structures that we drew. So we have BrO2 plus, so our valence electrons is 7 plus 2 times 6 minus 1. That gives us 18. When we get a completed Lewis dot structure, it looks like this. Yes, Jordan, I will work on an example for that. One second. Um, so in this case, if you had this as your Lewis dot structure, we now have one, two, three, steric number of three, and so we will get bromine with our oxygens out here at these two different structures. And so it would look like this. With a positive charge, the electron geometry would be trigonal, planar, and the molecular geometry would be bent as well. Now, one thing you'll notice if you look at these two compounds, they structurally are going to be quite similar. They're both bent, although the angles between these are going to be slightly different, whether it is a positive charge or a negative charge. So Jordan has asked that we do one with an odd number of valence electrons. So let's see. A compound with an odd number of valence electrons would be NO, yeah, so the valence electrons here would be 5 plus 6, which gives you 11. So when we draw our Lewis dot structure, we will start by giving everyone octet. So that gives us 8, 9, 10, 11. So nitrogen does not have octet, so we are going to end up
2, 4, 6, 8, 10, 11, 5 minus half of 4 times 3. So this is our compound. So when you draw the best first structure, you would end up with this structure to where you would basically just draw that there is a single electron. In all the years of my exam threes, I don't think I've ever asked about a valence, a Vesper structure of a odd electrons. Um, but when you have that happen, you basically just draw a single electron in this case. Most of the time, so BRO2 can have a single electron, and it would be a combined, it's a, you can also draw that structure. You base your Vesper structures based on the Lewis dot structures, which are identified based on their preferred structure. So if we were to also think about BRO2 no charge, We would have the valence electrons of 7 plus 2 times 6, so that's 12. So we'd have 19. So now we have, we have 16, 17, 18, 19. So... Formal charge on bromine would be 7 minus half of 4 minus 3, so 7 minus 2 minus 3 gives you plus 2. So in this case, it changes to be half of 6 minus 3, which gives you a negative positive 1. So I think the structure looks like this, where you would end up with bromine with an expanded oct, two, four, six, eight, 10, 12, that's impossible. You end up with this structure with a negative charge and a positive charge on that structure. And then your Lewis dot, your Vesper structure would follow those rules with the single electron functioning as a whole steric number. Good question. So, how many minutes? We have about five more minutes. So I will go ahead and solve the last GEHCl3. If you have other questions, let me know. So our valence electrons here would be 4 plus 1 plus 3 times 7, so 21, 22, 26, GE in the center. We're going to plop our chlorines on every side. And our hydrogen. From here, we can count 1, 2, 3, 4. There are four things connected. There are four we end up with a tetrahedral structure. To where you end up with an electron domain and a molecular structure that are both tetrahedral. Questions, thoughts. 
So far, this is easy. We definitely don't have time to do the next one. You should attempt it after. I'm not even going to show it to you. I'm just not even going to do it. I will work next that question. I will just add it to the exam three review, which will be next Monday. So, frankly, same time, same place. We'll be here. We'll do it on Monday. I will add that question in there. If you have drawn it and are like, I want to know if I'm right before Monday, feel free to send me an email with a screenshot. I will give it a look-see and let you know. What other questions do you guys have today, if you have any? What, other, what are your other thoughts or concerns about the material in Chapter 9? Thoughts, questions, concerns? If you have none, it's good to see you. Otherwise, you can stick around. You can ask some. Otherwise, I will see you guys next week when we get ready for exam three. Enjoy your Wednesday. There will be no live session because UNF is closed. So, any other questions, thoughts, concerns? So Catherine asks, does it matter where H goes on that? Asks, where does it, does it matter where the H goes? No. Um, there are some other structures where the symmetry of the molecule matters. Um, you tend to see that in steric numbers five and six, where you want the same atoms to either be on the equatorial plane or the axial plane, but otherwise they're the same. So Avery says, I'm confused about hybrids, but I think I just need more practice. I think so. Once with hybridization, the trick is to remember that there are only three options. No. Yes. And those correspond to the number of steric numbers. If you have somewhere else to be, you are welcome to roll out. I'm going to talk about hybrid orbitals for just another second, and then um, I too will roll out. So to make a steric number of four, so for an sp hybridized, it's an s orbital plus one p, so one s, plus one p orbital, and that equals two sp. Not the number, not like n equals two, but literally there are two of them. So you will have two equivalent orbitals. You only need two equivalent orbitals if you are a steric number of two. So there is never an instance, ever, where an asteric number of two does not have an SP, an SP hybridized center. It's just the way it goes. So for a steric number of two, you need to have two equivalent orbitals that you have mixed together, an S and a P. For an SP two, it's S plus P plus P, which gives you three equivalent S, P, two, and there's a single P left over. So these three are all the same. Up here you would have gotten S, P, and then P orbitals. So there are only four orbitals that you could mix together. That's all. So in this case, you mix these. When you have this, it is three equivalent which has to mean a steric number of three. So if you had sp3, you've added an s plus a p plus a p plus a p to where you get sp3. So you took this, an s, and then your p orbitals, and you got out 
for equivalent sp3 orbitals. And this only happens, so there are four equivalent, and this has to be a steric number of four, which is tetrahedral. So sometimes when people learn about hybridization, what they try to think about is this way to like calculate it. I think this is kind of like quantum numbers, which like the first three times you think about it, you're like, I'm never gonna figure this out. This is the worst day of my whole life. It turns out that quantum numbers are a lot like this. Once you realize that the patterns tell you the answer, you're gonna think about it that way. Uh, Avery asks, will you be asked to draw the electron configuration? No, you will be asked, what is the hybridization of this center? Um, I show it this way because that's how I think about where these numbers come from. But what I will say is for like GEHCl3, I would ask you, what is the hybridization of the GE? And that would be it. Good question. Any other questions? Any other thoughts? I can stick around for another second or two. Otherwise, I will let you guys enjoy the rest of your Monday, and I will see you next week. Good. Y'all have a fantastic rest of your Monday. See you next week.